Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, FY 2024 Office of Justice Programs Community-Based Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative, or CVIPI. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Tenzing Laden, Senior Policy Advisor with BJA, to begin the presentation. Tenzing. Thank you, Daryl. And good afternoon and welcome everyone to the FY24 Office of Justice Programs, Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative Solicitation Webinar. And if you have a copy of solicitation handy, you might want to pull that out to take notes as we will be going over key areas of the solicitation. As Daryl mentioned, my name is Tenzing Laden. I'm, I am with Bureau of Justice Assistance. I'm joined by a number of my colleagues who represent different offices within the Office of Justice Programs who are collaborating with BJA on the overall Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative, as well as on the solicitation. So you will hear from Kathy from Bureau of Justice Assistance, Sharon from Office for Victims of Crime, Scott from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and Elizabeth from the National Institute of Justice. As for today's agenda, we will provide a, pro a program overview and cover the eligibility and application requirements. And Elizabeth will provide an overview of the National Institute of Justice solicitation, followed by question and answer session. The CBIPI initiative provides funding to reduce violent crime by supporting comprehensive evidence-based violence intervention and prevention programs that involve partnerships between residents, residents, local governments, victim service providers, community-based organizations, researchers, and other community stakeholders. The CBIPI initiative is a priority for our leadership and it clearly aligns clearly with both DOJ and OJP missions as stated on the slide. Next. As I mentioned earlier, this initiative is a collaboration of several of the components within the Office of Justice programs, including BJA, OGJDP, OVC, NIJ, all of whom are participating on this webinar. And the involvement of all these individuals allows to ensure that we are including a focus on victims, juvenile justice ish system issues, as well as supporting important research on effective practices. This collaborative approach will provide jurisdictions access to expertise in addressing community violence involving youth, young adults, and adults, and both those who perpetrate this violence, as well as those who are victims of the, uh, of the violence. The four principles of guide us in this work. The first we are focusing, first we are focusing on the targeted violence intervention that identifies and supports the highest need and the highest risk group, as opposed to the at risk group more generally. Reaching hard to engage population of any age through trusted, credible messengers and disrupting the uh, cycle of violence and retaliation, ensuring that these approaches are community centered and equity focused. Involving the community being served is critical in this work. Uh, integration with public safety and public health, taking the multidisciplinary approach to uh, approach with public, private, and community partners to form a coalition or an ecosystem to prevent and reduce violence, strengthen community resilience, and build social capital, among other things. Uh, also ensuring that that it is also strategic, data-driven, performance-focused. We encourage, as a part of this, uh, as part of these projects, to do a strategic planning to identify the CBI approaches that best fit your community. Partner with researchers to support analysis and understanding of what's driving the violence, and help determine what's working and what needs to be changed or modified. And here's a quick overview of different categories and number of awards we expect to make and the maximum uh, award amount for each. Uh, solicitation categories are similar to last year. Category one is for community-based organizations and travel organizations, and we are expecting to make anywhere from eight to 12 awards for up to two million each. Category two focuses on applicants from city, county, and tribal government. Similar to category one, we are expecting to make anywhere from eight to 12 awards for up to 2 million each. For category three, uh, it is for state government applicants, and we are expecting to make four to five awards for up to 4 million each. Lastly, category four focuses on capacity building, where we will be funding intermediary organizations to make smaller awards to local agencies 
that often aren't able to get settled uh, funds or haven't had access to them. We're expecting to make uh, three to four awards for up to four million each. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kathy Braddock. Thank you, Tenzing, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to start talking about some of the eligibility and application requirements. Uh, so, Daryl, can we go to the next one? Uh, so, I'm going to talk about the first two categories because a lot of the requirements are the same. As, as Tenzing said, these are for the community-based uh, organizations as well as the uh, government, uh, local government agencies. Uh, the focus of these are to support efforts to develop and implement and expand or enhance um, CBI strategies. Uh, it's intended for organizations and local governments at all stages of CBI implementation. So you may be, uh, if you're not already doing a CBI, doing CBI work, it could be for starting that up, or it could be for uh, enhancing or expanding uh, existing efforts. Um, one of the important things that you'll probably hear uh, throughout this is that this is really a, a multidisciplinary team um, is really needed to, to implement this work. Um, before I go on, I wanted to kind of pause a little bit here um, just uh, because we have already been receiving some questions from the field to the OJP Resource Center. And we've had some questions about from <clears throat> our current site-based grantees, so those who have been funded in the last couple of years, about whether or not they can apply and, and how they could use the funds. And I want to emphasize here um, that these funds are for starting up a new program or enhancing um, or, or expanding uh, an existing one. These funds may not be used to supplement an existing award or to simply sustain a program. So if you're thinking of about reapplying, um, you know, just note that during our funding process, what we look at is past funding, and we will be making sure that this is not duplicating any other work um, and that there's sufficient progress on your existing award to support some expansion or enhancement. So if there are any other questions on this, like we can take that at the Q&A, but I just, this has come up several times, so I thought I would address it up front. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, so, the overall, um, we're looking for organizations to um, have a, a, a planning phase in the beginning. The, the length of time needed will vary depending on where you are um, in the process. Uh, research partners are required under category uh, one and two, and this I, I'll refer to them, I guess, as the local research partners. Um, and uh, these um, individuals should be an active member of the working group um, and you know, using a, an action research method uh, to, to assist the team in uh, getting important information about, uh, the, about the community um, and in implementing new strategies. Um, training and technical assistance will be provided to grants that are made in this category by the OJP funded TPA provider which is the Community-Based Public Safety Collective. I shall note in there that we are encouraging uh, rigorous about evaluations of these programs. There's still a lot we want to learn about what, what's effective and, and you know, how these, um, the impacts of, of CBI. So you're gonna hear a lot more about this at the end. Elizabeth will go into it, but just wanted to point out that um, for categories, uh, one and two, um, we're encouraging you to participate in an evaluation and partner, I mean, not partner really, but um, work with a, an outside evaluator who can submit uh, an application through the NIJ uh, uh, solicitation uh, that would um, look, uh, provide an external evaluation of your program. Uh, this is one of the priority areas for um, for application uh, in, in the solicitation. Again, something we will get into a little bit more, but just wanted to, uh, to, to note that. So next slide. Uh, in terms of eligibility, um, and just note too that we, we're pulling out a few things to highlight. Just because we don't highlight it and it's in the does not mean it's not important. 
the um, the solicitation is your guide for what needs to be in. So just just pointing out a few things that where questions tend to come up. Uh, so for category one, we're looking at you know nonprofits um, and uh, other local organizations. Um, uh, tribal organizations are also uh, eligible. Uh, for category two, uh, this is the city or township government, town county government, uh, tribal government, so um, a full range of different government entities. And so, and we expect that, you know, so what we're talking about here is who the applicant is. Um, the expectation is that, you know, there will be a multidisciplinary team. And so, on, in both types, we expect to have partners and the others, but this is focused on who the lead applicant is. There are some basic deliverables. Um, you know, we encourage people, you all to uh, submit letters of commitment and MOUs up front with the application, but we know that's not always possible. So we will ask for those in the first um, six months. Uh, you're expected to develop or enhance, a, um, you know, a community specific violence reduction strategic plan. Um, and then at the end, you will submit a final report that summarizes the activities uh, of, of the program, including successes and lessons learned. And now I will hand it over to my colleague, Sharon Fletcher. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to walk us through um, our next category of eligibility, and that is category three for state governments. Um, so in this section, um, we are looking for, or under this category rather, um, we are looking to fund state government agencies that um, coordinating and supporting local level CVI strategies through subawards across multiple communities or jurisdictions um, in the state. So um, multiple locations are definitely um, highlighted there. We're hoping that applicants will propose either to develop or implement new strategies to support CVI implementation at the local level or they will um, submit to enhance or expand the reach of existing state level strategies to support CVI implementation at the local level. So either again, looking for new um, strategies or um, proposing to expand and enhance new um, strategies, but always on the local level. Um, applicants of course should propose um, some of the things we've already covered, but um, again, we're still looking for multidisciplinary teams of stakeholders. Um, that would be responsible for coordinating the state's approach um, um, their CVI efforts. And they should, of course, have an attachment labeled CVI PI team with the participants' names and uh, as well as their names of their agencies in it. So we can see how diverse that team is um, and the different um, organizations, agencies, what have you, that are supporting those CVI um, strategies and development across your given state. Um, deliverables for category three. Um, include developing and implementing a process for assessing and addressing gaps in local government. So we do anticipate that applicants would conduct an assessment of the local drivers of violence in their state, um, as well as an existing, um, I'm sorry, an assessment of existing efforts and gaps and resources to meet those needs. So we wanna make sure that you're having, um, a, using a thoughtful approach um, and having some data-driven um, Decision making involved in how you're selecting both the strategies that are being in, um, included in the application, as well as who you intend to target. Um, and then we do anticipate that you would be engaged, these applicants would be engaged rather in some strategic planning to identify priorities. Um, we are hoping these applicants will also support against the local implementation of those CBI strategies through sub awards to those. Um, projects across the state. And um, the final deliverable, of course, would be a final report that would both describe what strategies were implemented, um, assess the outcomes, to, um, identify promising practices, and things of that nature. So we really want to have that final report kind of detailing what happened, what you learned, um, and of course, most importantly, um, what challenges you encountered and why, so that we can hopefully learn from that um, in future submissions. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Moving on to category four. Um, one uh, very big area that we found um, is useful in the field. It has been really helping us learn a lot more about what's going on on the ground in local agencies 
that are doing the work um, as our category four CVIPI capacity building category. Now this category is really important for us because there are a number of organizations we know that are smaller and perhaps not ready to take on um, the responsibility of directly applying for federal funding, but they could benefit from some partnership and um, support from larger organizations that could serve as their fiscal agents um, and help them kind of grow um, to the capacity where perhaps they could be able to um, serve direct funding. And so the category four very much is um, intended to help us build that capacity across the field so that um, more organizations are um, able to consider and perhaps um, successfully apply for direct funding. But this um, category, in this category, we're looking to fund a four intermediary organizations that will serve as fiscal agents. And again, provide sub awards to um, up to five community based organizations over the course of the project period. These inter intermediate organizations could be national, regional, or more local organizations um, that have the established capacity, of course, to work with CBOs, um, and particularly those CBOs that are working um, in those uh, neighborhoods that are most impacted by violence and focused on underserved communities. Um, applicants in this area should have a deep knowledge and experience um, in working and supporting CVI strategies, as well as strong connection and close connection to victims and survivors, um, which we know is a critical component of the work. Um, we do um, allow um, for those intermediary organizations to be comprised of multiple collaborating entities that collectively possess these range of skills, because again, we do anticipate that this would also be a multidisciplinary approach uh, used to support um, the organizations that they're funding through those sub awards. Um, we are also open to a range of models to be used by the um, intermediary organizations, intermediary organizations. Um, and so we're open to innovation and what's happening in the field. We do anticipate that the sub awards that the intermediaries put out would be done in a competitive fashion, um, not unlike the one that we're using for this solicitation. Um, and so those sub awards should range in between 100 and $250,000. Um, of course, depending on the capacity of the organizations that are uh, applying as well as the type of efforts that they would be funding. Um, and those award amounts would be in total so that um, uh, funding could be broken out over a period of time, um, but still within the overall award period. CBOs would use the funding to increase the capacity um, of their organizations um, and workforce development in support of CVI efforts. Um, and those sub awards that are going through the intermediaries could include funding for things such as salary, equipment, um, materials, training opportunities, and travel costs um, associated with training and technical assistance. Um, they could also be used to support development of curricula, assessment tools, um, as well as building out organizational policies and procedures around wellness plans and other things that we know are critically important to support CVI organizations. Um, eligibility for category four um, in this capacity building space includes public and state controlled institutions of higher education. So your universities, both public and state controlled, private institutions of higher education. So both um, private and public universities, nonprofits that do or don't have 501c3 status, um, as well as and for profit organizations, including small business. Um, so the key here, so we have a range of organizations, but the key here is to have that experience um, and demonstrated experience working with CVI strategies and connection to communities. Deliverables for category four um, include uh, the working with OJP to um, develop the solicitation and proposal for funding that will go out to fund the sub awards um, in this category four area. Um, including developing and hosting a pre-application solicitation webinar, much like the one we're engaged in right now. Um, the uh, lucky applicants would also, if selected for funding, would also work with um, OJP um, to identify those sub-recipient sites as part of the sub-reward process. So by that, we just mean that uh, we would be involved in that whole application review and selection piece for the various for this um, sub awards funded by the applicant, um, 
And we were asking that each of those this criteria here be met for those subawards, including identifying one CRAS strategy that it plans to initiate or expand in the jurisdiction that it clearly identifies resources um, needed to support that strategy and build the capacity as well as have some demonstrated capacity and willingness to work collaboratively with a TTA provider. Because um, we know those supports will be necessary again um, with the goal of building the capacity of those uh, organizations. Next slide, please. Once the subawards are made, the awardees will conduct meetings with the subrecipient CBOs, um, complete again a needs assessment for those organizations to make sure that we are tailoring the supports to their specific needs. Um, and we're also asking that the intermediaries conduct some regional topical meetings across sites to on common issues, um, because we know that peer learning is often where a lot of really rich engagement and capacity building takes place, um, as well as uh, coordinating with different um, TA re resources um, and informing them on initiatives across uh, OJP offices, which include, of course, the Office of Victims of Crime, where I work, um, OJJDP, and BJA. Additional deliverables um, under Category 4 include um, developing an online resource for subrecipients and others to search and assess any, um, access rather, any knowledge products that are developed by the CBOs or by the intermediary. And then, of course, again, completing a final report that really covers um, in detail the description of the strategy supported by the subrecipients, um, you know, outcomes of what they were able to do, um, lessons learned, and again, um, helping us document any challenges encountered so that um, we can learn from those uh, in uh, both in our CBI strategies and our work with our CBI programs and also in how we put together our own solicitations. So uh, another area I would like to highlight for everyone, and if you've been applying for any of our OJP solicitations, you've seen this in other solicitations as well. But um, our CVI strat, I mean, CVI solicitation this year does consider have um, priority considerations for all categories, and so those considerations are in support of Executive Order one three nine eight five, advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities. Um, and this was put out several years ago by the Biden administration. And so the top two areas in that include applicants that include projects that will promote racial equity and remove barriers to access and opportunities for communities that have been historically underserved, marginalized, and adversely affected by equality when making award decisions. Um, and you'll need to explain how your programs are doing so in your applications. Um, the second category that um, we are given priority consideration are those applicants that demonstrate their capacity and capability for implementing their proposed projects um, is um, enhanced because either their or the main lead organization or a subrecipient will receive at least 40% of the um, funding as demonstrated in the budget. Um, and they identify as a culturally specific organization. And so um, that would have to be clearly demonstrated in the budget that 40% of the award will be going to that culturally specific organization or the um, lead applicant would have to explain how they are themselves um, identifying as a culturally specific organization. Um, additional priority consideration areas include applicants from communities that have documented high or increased levels of homicides per capita. And again, that documentation should be clearly outlined and included in the proposal narratives. We are also giving consideration to applicants that can demonstrate that their existing partnerships with multidisciplinary team stakeholders, because um, you, you've probably heard us say that quite a few times already in this uh, uh, webinar today, but we are giving priority consideration to those and we expect those um, that demonstration to come through either inclusion of letters of commitment or MOUs with the application submission. Um, and we are asking that those attachments be labeled CBI PI team with the names of those participating agencies or organizations, um, as well as the individuals from those organizations that are supporting your efforts. Um, and then we're also ask, giving some priority consideration to applicants that are proposing a companion evaluation under the NIJ solicitation that we will hear about towards the end of today's webinar. Um, but I do this last little bar and then at the bottom of the slide, um, I do want to give you all a 
a little reminder though that addressing the priority considerations is only one of the factors that we're considering in making funding decisions. So just being able to qualify for one or more of those alone does not guarantee an award. And so next I will pass it off to my colleague, Scott. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, so just want to talk a little bit about some additional resources. Uh, you'll see on the screen, uh, there's two seminal resources. Uh, there is a web page that uh, BJA uh, manages that has key information regarding community violence intervention and prevention initiative work. It includes uh, a guiding principles document, um, a checklist, uh, glossary of terms, strategies, and many other relevant materials. So I encourage you to look at that to make sure that the type of work you're endeavoring is consistent with the type of uh, initiative that uh, is being supported through the CVIPI um, solicitation. Um, the Resource and Field Support Center, uh, also known as the Center, um, provides uh, a, a, just a plethora of resources and tools to support communities looking to plan or implement approaches, CVI approaches, and TTA support. Um, so I encourage you to look at that. Um, you know, the, there's a resource library that provides um, resources, tools to support communities looking to plan or implement approaches. And, um, you know, it, it's not like limited to whether or not you're funded. This is an open support um, center for any interested app applicant or, or, or you know, CBO, um, governmental based organization doing work in the community. So please look at that. Next slide. Um, so, you know, another thing we want to look at is what the application should include. Um, certainly, you need to include an abstract 400 words maximum that really summarizes your proposed project that also includes primary activities, products, and deliverables, the service area, and who will benefit from the proposed project. This is difficult to do. 400 words is tough, but just uh, really focus on what is that core area of, of what you're looking to do with your initiative and uh, include that. That is your abstract. Um, that's a necessary component of your submission. Another is your program narrative. Um, that needs to include a description of the issue, project design and implementation, capabilities and competencies, and your plan for collecting data required for the solicitation's performance measures. You don't have to speak to the performance measures. You need to be able to speak to that you have a plan for being able to capture those measures. Um, that's an important piece. Um, also on the capabilities and competencies, you know, you may or may not have uh, liaised with uh, DOJ in terms of uh, um, grantsmanship previously, and that's okay. But um, to the extent that you have, speak to it. To the extent that you haven't, you know, connect with the work that you've done um, locally within your community to really enhance and buttress the supports that you have um, to um, to really show that you're a capable and competent organization to to, to move forward with whatever project design you're proposing in your um, response to the solicitation. Um, in terms of budget, um, you need to submit a budget worksheet and a narrative. It's a web-based form, and you need to complete that through Just Grants, which is our um, interface with your um, submission of your ultimate application. There's a two-step process we'll talk about in a minute, but your ultimate submission is going to be through Just Grants, and um, make sure that that federal request amount matches um, the amount in your SF-424, which is your application for federal assistance. Next slide. So there's additional components that you need to include. A timeline is uh, essential um, relative to this particular uh, solicitation. Um, any subrecipients that you are proposing, you need to document those as part of your application. Um, resumes or position descriptions, qualifications relative to their job roles. You'll want to make sure you articulate that in your application. Um, any sort of memorandum of understanding that you've had, um, whether it's fully articulated or not, letters of support, other supportive documents, the team that will kind of comprise the, the supports for the um, CVIPI initiative that you're endeavoring, it's important that you include that. And an organizational chart is also um, an important component. Next slide. Um, if you if you have if you are a tribal entity submitting, you want to include a tribal authorizing resolution. Um, if you are doing research um, as part of this, you will want to uh, 
um, you know, include a research and evaluation and independence and integrity um, piece as a submission as part of your application. Um, you must include disclosures and assurances, assurances that talk about um, disclosures of your lobbying act activities, if any, um, any sort of duplication and cost items, um, your standard certified assurances, and then any sort of uh, certifications regarding lobbying, debarment, suspension, and other responsibility matters, and drug-free workplace requirements. These are just norm pro forma um, elements of submitting an application. And then your applicant disclosure and justification, should you be a DOJ high-risk grantee? Um, you know, you, you'll know if you, if you are um, um, assigned that, um, you know, that, 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 um, that term. Um, if, if not, you don't have to worry about that particular uh, element. I, I will say that uh, one piece I want to mention is about the duplication and cost items. You know, so you may, um, um, you may be submitting some other applications, um, other, un, other, un, other federal funding pieces that may be supporting similar components. Um, the, the piece there is to say, look, um, we did or we are also pursuing similar supports through X, Y, and Z solicitation. It's important because one thing we don't want to do is we want to supplement. We don't want to supplant. We don't want to duplicate. So this is just a way for you to um, make sure that you're, you know, capturing the fact that you're, you know, that you're uh, maybe going far and wide in terms of your potential supports for the work that you're doing. Um, uh, that you're applying for. Um, so that's an important component. Next slide. So the basic minimum requirements is the minimum elements that must be submitted in order for you to be peer reviewed. Um, so um, that's the proposal abstract, the narrative, the budget worksheet, which is the web based form, which includes the budget details and budget narrative, as well as the timeline. So if, if you were to submit the first three, and exclude a timeline, you would not pass go and would not be able to um, be peer reviewed, and you would be eliminated from, uh, you know, fr from uh, this this uh, competitive uh, process. So I just want to underscore these these four elements are critical if you're going to endeavor um, an application with us. Next slide. Um, so applications are and are reviewed to ensure that they meet these basic minimum requirements that we just talked about. Um, and, you know, if they are, then you move forward to peer review. Um, and we typically, we have 3 external subject matter experts that review, um, the applications, um, federal staff are a part of each of those panels. Um, those scores are presented to the BJA program representative and then your justice assistant staff work with. OJP colleagues to provide scoring results with recommendations for funding to the Office of Justice Programs leadership. And then the BJA director ultimately makes the final decision decision and submits recommended applications to the principal deputy assistant attorney general at OJP. So it's a fairly transparent process. Um, and I think it's, it's it's worked well, and I think it will continue to work well, but we want to make sure that you understand the process as you move forward in your um, consideration of applying for this. Next slide. So, uh, two, one really important thing to note is that there's dual deadlines. Um, there is a, an initial deadline of um, applying uh, within grants.gov, and that's May 30th. That is a very, very simple process, and it's simply submitting your SF-424, which is your application for federal assistance, and your lobbying disclosure form. It is a very quick process. However, it's a necessary process in order for you to be able to move forward and submit your fully articulated application by June 10th. Meaning, if you fail to meet that very basic requirement of submitting your SF-424 and your lobbying disclosures in grants.gov by May 30th, you will not be allowed to submit a fully articulated application on June 10th and you will basically not be able to submit an application. So I encourage every one of you on this call to really, um, if you're really, really committed to this, um, applying for this initiative to get in early ahead of the May 30th deadline for the grants.gov um, submission 
get it done. That way, if you have some issues or hiccups, you can address those, get them submitted, and you'll be able to then move forward to uh, pass go, so to speak, to submit your fully articulated application by June 10th. Similarly, I encourage you, if you do pass that first initial piece um, that you try to submit your application prior to June 10th so that you don't hit any stumbling blocks with just grants or any other submission element that would delay your ability to fully submit um, prior to the deadline of June 10th at 859 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I cannot underscore this more um, more clearly. I think that it's one of the biggest things that we've heard frustrations from grantees for in the past, um, but a lot of those frustrations are borne by an inability to proactively submit applications ahead of the deadline. So please eliminate that frustration. If you're putting all the sweat equity into applying, please do, please uh, support these processes ahead of the deadline so that you're not uh, hitting a hitting a wall. Um, next slide. So there's, um, this is a nicely, uh, laid out a slide that you should maybe print out and have on your cork board if you have one. I still do. I'm old school. Um, that just kind of lists uh, your various uh, um, touch points for grants.gov and just grants uh, um, help and uh, support. Um, it's a fairly robust support network in terms for both grants.gov and just grants, understanding that the majority of your um, assist is probably going to be the just grants end uh, once you submit the, the grants.gov piece, but um, this is an important piece of information for you to have. Um, next slide. And so the response center, and this is really critical. Um, we have an Office of Justice Programs Response Center that the department, um, uh, you know, employs to really support um, our solicitation um, work. Um, you know, whether it be this webinar, um, responses to questions that come up, um, it's critical that you go through this central process by email, web chat, or through your, you know, the toll free or TTY number to um, connect, ask any questions that you have so that they can be cataloged appropriately, responded to, and that you can move forward with, uh, with responding to the solicitation with, um, with clarity and with um, conviction. Next slide. A couple of do's and don'ts. Um, please use simple and concise language. Um, ensure that the information is presentable and organized. Um, add tables, graphs, photos, other images when possible. Being mindful of grant guidelines, um, page limits, that sort of thing. Be a realistic, realistic about how you will achieve goals. Get feedback from those who may run the project. Uh, make sure the proposal is consistent with the solicitation. Check, recheck, check again, and then recheck once more. Your budget, grant requirements, references, and other grant details. Can't um, impart this, uh, imported this enough. Um, and then we'll go to the next slide. So stay connected. Um, this is a just a social media opportunity to connect through YouTube, Facebook, X, around uh, um, various opportunities to stay connected. I use this QR code that um, connects you to news from BJA that'll get you latest information from BJA in the field. Um, the BJA's website's also listed. So please utilize these resources to, uh, to avail yourself of current funding opportunities that may come available, you know, subsequent to this currently um, open um, competitive um, solicitation. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my very capable colleague and friend, Elizabeth Simpson. Thank you, Scott. Um, thank you to everyone for joining this afternoon and um, we appreciate your time. I'm going to spend a few minutes building on um, what my OJ P colleagues have already presented and talk with you about the um, NIJ uh, FY24 CVI PI research and evaluation solicitation. Um, I would like to stress the um, importance of um, utilizing both the solicitation document for um, reference. And um, there's a link to that in the bottom of this slide. And then also, again, just reiterating what Scott said about utilizing the OJP um, support center services, because um, this is a, going to be an overview with highlights and we want to make sure any questions you have can be answered thoroughly. So the NIJ, um, C oh, 
CVI PI research and evaluation funding opportunity um, is for um, uh, research of CVI PI sites. The um, grants.gov submission deadline is June 18th. Um, and the closing date, the final closing date for the applications is July 2nd. Next slide, please. Uh, just a brief overview, the National Institute of Justice is uh, the research development and evaluation agency for um, the Department of Justice. We're dedicated to improving knowledge and understanding of crime and criminal justice issues. Um, NIJ has a model of um, listen, learn, and inform. Uh, we listen to the field. We learn about um, how we can fulfill the needs of the field, and then we disseminate um, and inform the field through multimedia. Um, we disseminate knowledge and tools um, that are based on rigorous and objective scientific research. And the goal of NIJ in the CVIPI is to support independent, rigorous evaluations of projects funded under um, the OJP CVIPI solicitation, which is the awards that we were just, or the solicitation that my colleagues were just speaking about. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the NIJ solicitation um, has two funding categories. The first is evaluation research of programmatic sites that are funded under OJP FY23 and FY24 CVIPI solicitations. And the second category is evaluations of research of other community violence programs. So um, some basic principles that are applicable to both evaluation categories. Um, we're looking for rigorous, independent outcome and or impact evaluations. Um, they must include components of the process or implementation evaluation in order to measure the program implementation fidelity. And the foundational evaluation work um, for this um, groundwork for, excuse me, the foundational evaluation work that lays the groundwork for future rigorous outcome and impact evaluations must include a developmental evaluation or a formative evaluation and a process evaluation, which can include an impact evalu evaluable assessment, excuse me. Um, the applicant uh, for NIJ solicitations can apply for more than one um, uh, solicitation, or they can apply multiple times within each category, but there must be a different um, project site for each application. And we are looking for action research with both of the uh, solicitation categories. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, funding for category one is the evaluation research of programmatic sites funded under OJP FY23 and FY24 CVIPI solicitations. Uh, the total number of awards will be determined by the number of applications that are received and those that have merit. Um, funding will be up to $5 million for multiple awards. And these are to be funded as grants. Uh, the performance period will be up to 60 months, and you can apply for less than that if you feel it's appropriate. We are looking for formative or process evaluations, outcome and impact evaluations that include program implementation. Next slide, please. Um, under category one, we're talking about partnering with um, uh, CVIPI sites that have been funded under OJP FY23 category one or two, or those that are submitting a, an application concurrently for FY24 um, OJP CVIPI categories one or two. And uh, I think it has been mentioned, but I will mention again, it is extremely important that you make note both in the cover page and in the application that you have included um, that you are working with and applying with a CVI PI site um, that as part of your application process. Um, we um, have a list of CVI PI program sites that you can view. Um, there's links um, 
for funding for categories one and two that have BJA funded awards and a map of the FY23 award grantees. That also includes FY22 um, grantees. Um, all qualifying um, program applicants under um, CVI PI categories one or two are eligible. And of course, you can look to the solicitation to see what um, sorts of programs are included in that application um, universe. For funding category two, um, it is evaluation research of other community violence programs. So uh, we are looking for um, applications in this category for programs that have not received funding through FY23, FY22, or FY24 CVIPI um, federal funding. Um, the total number of awards will be determined by the number of applications that have been received and their merit. And we will be funding up to $1 million for multiple awards. These are also to be um, funded as grants. And these are outcome and impact evaluations that build on evidence of CVIPI program impact. So again, we're looking for action research with these. Solicitation categories um, in both cases for category one and category two. Applicants should demonstrate meaningful engagement with the people closest to the subject of study, including the practitioners, the community members, and um, others who are working in the field and represent crime victims, people that potentially are under criminal justice supervision, and members of high crime communities. Applicants must clearly document their collaboration with programmatic sites, and that needs to be done by a memor memorandum of understanding or a letter of support with commitment to the project and um, start dates um, for sharing data. Um, we also would like to stress that this is not, these solicitations are not to provide any direct services funding. Uh, these are, these, this funding is for evaluation purposes. The deliverables that we will be asking for with the NIJ um, solicitation is a final research report, a research impact brief. Uh, we are encouraging an interim study report with preliminary findings. Uh, require data sets and adherence to the NIJ data archiving plan, and then scholarly products that can include a variety of multimedia projects. We also want to stress again that it is important that the data um, is um, available and utilized and is part of working with the um, CVI PI sites and that they are um, meaningful and uh, uh, engaged partners in the research evaluation process. For uh, this is some information about NIJ, um, an overview of our uh, research um, mission process, listen, learn, and inform, um, our newsletter link, and our social media. Um, I would like to encourage you to visit our website and you can see our past award. Um, uh, recipients and get more information about the work that we are doing in with CVIPI um, as part of the larger OJP um, project work. So I am going to turn it back over now um, and I just want to say thank you to everyone and again please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Thank you. So uh, I was saying thank you Elizabeth and thank you also to all the presenters today. Uh, uh, for covering the solicitation and, and uh, we will now move into our question and answer session and I'll be asking the uh, going to uh, I'm not sure if we will get time to go through all the questions that came in through Q&A but we will be you know uh, collecting all the questions and uh, uh, responding to those questions uh, so uh, I, I saw a few questions around category four so maybe Kathy, if you can explain a little bit more about category for like the role of intermediary organizations and the sub award process and who can apply, I think that would be really helpful. Sure. Um, yes, I, I saw a lot of these and I'll try to kind of hit some of the points in the questions. Um, so uh, we're, we are looking for um, uh, entities that are able to make sub awards to uh, other 
to CBOs or a smaller organization um, that cannot uh, that ha don't have the capacity um, to apply for funds on their own because and the goal is for them to you know make the sub award to work with the uh, with the those grantees and provide training and technical assistance. Um, there were questions, you know, about flexibility and sort of what would propose there um, in terms of the uh, amount, the range um, of uh, the, the size of the sub awards. And so there is some flexibility there. I think if you're going to divert um, from what is on like the range there, uh, of funding that you would do, uh, the number of sites that you would propose, you need to uh, make a strong justification uh, for why you are doing that. Um, so I think hopefully that sort of encompasses uh, the, so. Thank you, Kathy. And I think one of the other questions that came up was around, you know, can, if, if an applicant is a current CBIPI grantee, can they apply for a grant in FY24? Like, if they're planning to expand or uh, expand their project or add new sites or something along that line? Right, yeah. So, you could apply for funding to expand the program into another area to add, you know, a component to the program to enhance it. Um, in some way, I know there was some question in there about the word duplicate um, and uh, that shouldn't be duplicating the, the, when I mentioned that earlier, that, you know, what you don't want to do is be uh, supplementing that current award um, and, you know, working on those same activities. These need to be kind of a discrete uh, enhancement uh, and um, uh, or expansion. And uh, you should, though, have sufficient progress so that we can see that it is, it's ready for that, um, that expansion. Thank you. One of the other questions was around, uh, are public school districts eligible for any of the categories, uh, or would they need to partner with a nonprofit or other government entities to apply for the grant for in any of the four categories? So I think technically a public school could as part of a local um, agency, but it would be encouraged. I mean, for all of these programs, we uh, encourage um, you to have a multidisciplinary team, and I know that's kind of come up. So, um, you know, what category you're, you're applying to is based on the lead agency. Um, you, but, you know, we hope that you will have a range of stakeholders from your community. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, there were a few questions around research, you know, whether, you know, it is required to partner with a research uh, organization. There was also some, uh, I don't want to say confusion around the NIJ research piece and the requirement uh, in the solicitation to partner with research. So, if you or Elizabeth can talk a little bit about that research piece. I can clarify the point that the, the local research partner is, uh, is required for categories one and two, um, and that is the person that will be part of the team and working with the, um, with the, uh, with the team. Um, to uh, you know, collect data and look at impacts and, and, a, and a range of things. Um, the external evaluator is somebody uh, that should be from a, a, a will often be from a, a different agency um, that will be doing a, a full evaluation. Maybe I should turn that over to Elizabeth. Um, thank you, Kathy. Um, yes, there is no requirement to have um, uh, an external evaluator, um, but the uh, NIJ, National Institute of Justice, offers two options to fund um, evaluations of programs. And one, um, category one, is for organizations that have received funding in FY23 
or are also applying um, in FY24 for funding. Um, the reason that uh, we stressed about identifying a partnership is so that that can be taken into consideration when we are doing our review. Um, there is no requirement that you have a funding partner. It's just something that is part of our consideration um, during the review. And you can um, also be uh, conduct an independent evaluation um, for a CVI project that has not received federal funding. That's under our category too. Does that help? Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I think one of the, just to clarify, um, applicants don't have to apply uh, for NIJ research solicitation uh, if they are category one or two, uh, but they need to have a research partner on their application, regardless of whether they apply for NIJ research solicitation or not. Right, Kathy? Yeah. And one of the other questions that came up was around, if you can define what high risk is, Yes, um, that came up multiple times, and I have been directing uh, folks to page nine in the solicitation where we really uh, spelled this out a little bit more than we have in previous uh, um, uh, solicitation. Um, but essentially, we're looking at those who are the persistent offenders, the highest risk of who are. Um, generally at highest risk of victimization as well as um, perpetration, perpetrating violence and that are, um, have traditionally not been able to be served by uh, many programs in the past. So, uh, but I would encourage you to go look um, on page nine uh, for more clarity on that. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, one of the other questions was around project period and funding. Uh, and I know this question came up uh, you know, to our OGP response center also. So uh, uh, just to clarify, the project period end date is, you know, so if, um, you know, the award amount should last the full project period end date. Uh, so, I, Kathy, do you want to talk a little bit more about, because that question around will we get a supplement funding, you know, in the other years, is it for one year only, especially for, uh, category four, would there be any supplements? So if you can talk a little bit about that, that would be helpful. Sure, so your application is for, um, you know, either for 2 million or 4 million, depending on what category you're applying for, for three years of funding. Um, there is no expectation of any supplements for any of these. This is the um, three years to, to implement that. Um, so, uh, hopefully that's clear. Kathy, do we have the, some time for additional questions? I know we are past I, the 2 p.m. mark. Yeah, I think we are um, uh, past time here. And what I would just emphasize, I know Daryl put this in the, uh, in the chat for you all, please. I mean, we really appreciate that you, uh, you had so many questions, we just were not able to get to all of them. Um, we responded, hopefully you saw the ones that we did in the Q&A section. And uh, so please, if we did not get to your question, please contact the OGP uh, Response Center and uh, they will uh, take care um, and, and we'll be able to get back to you that way. Great. And yes, just also a reference, the recording PowerPoint slides and transcript for today will be posted to BJ's website. So everybody that registered today will receive an email where and when to access that. So on behalf of the Bureau of Justice Assistance and all of our panelists, we want to thank you for joining today's webinar. This will end today's presentation.